Good morning and welcome to the largest European Championship in history. We got more than 1,860 players this weekend, so it's gonna be a big one. We already streamed all of yesterday. It's been basically the first main event of the weekend. Now we're starting the second main event of the weekend. Some of Europe's finest duelists are here. We have five players that didn't punch the ticket to Worlds yesterday in the top eight playoff. They're gonna be back today. Even some of the guys that got a ticket to Worlds are gonna be playing again today because they wanna make the lives harder for the other guys uh, because they want less competition at the World Championship. So it's gonna be a very, very exciting weekend. Uh, we actually have some, some super interesting stats for you already, even though it's that early in the day. And I know that you're all waiting for the feature match and for the stream to kick off. So let's not waste any more time and go with it. In round number one, we got the reigning Dutch national champion. He is going up against one of the invaders, so to speak, from Germany. We got Luca Braz. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, thanks. How did you qualify for the European Championship? Uh, or uh, played the regional, obviously. In, in a regional. I mean, yeah, there's other ways you can also do really well at the re uh, YCS and stuff like that. So, uh, what was your preparation like for this tournament? Yeah, obviously tested pretty much, very much, but yeah, I'm kind of confident. Kind of confident. Yeah. Okay. How are you feeling about your chances going up against Joshua Osters, the the two-time Dutch national champion? Yeah, it's obviously going to be hard, but I try my best. Yeah, and actually I have to say, because uh, Daniel uh, said this to me yesterday, sometimes the interviews are making people nervous. So I have to tell you, and I'm not doing this out of contractual obligations, the underdog is very often coming out on top in the feature match. And Joshua specifically has a very bad record in feature matches. He's, he's known to, to flake out in feature matches. So you got this, okay? Thanks. I'm not saying this because you're chairman. Please have a seat. His opponent, as we said, Joshua Oosters. Good morning. Good morning. How are you feeling today? You woke up? Pretty good. I, I woke up, yeah. <laughs> then I went here. Yeah. Now I'm going to play card games. And how many times did you win the Dutch Nationals? This twice, right? Yeah, twice. That's okay. correct. Yeah. So um, what's different the second time it happens? Uh, I think it was more special because I was the first person to win the Dutch Nationals twice. Okay. And it was one of my long time goals to do. So well, that was really the, good. The second win or the first win? I guess uh, first the first win and then you set yeah, a new goal, yeah, basically. Yeah, I guess, yeah. All right. So you obviously you're known to, to come to these tournaments prepared. Um, how much work is it for you? How much uh, hours did you put in uh, leading up to this tournament? Um, it's I'm very busy with my actual work, but uh, I mostly just test it with my friends, see what I liked about the deck or which deck I liked, and then I just always play what I like. Okay. Like I never play something I don't like to play. I always want to have fun while I play the deck. So how are you feeling with your deck choice? I'm actually not that happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you don't like it that much? Well, I do really like the deck, I just don't think it's that good. Okay, okay. so that's something different. I see, I see. How are you feeling about playing in the feature match now? Um, I think I'm used to it by now. Mm -hmm. It's still like kind of, I still get kind of nervous. Yeah. It's just like the cameras and stuff. Right. And you know all the people online, they're going to judge you for your place. So. Well, the people online love you as far as I know at least. They, they always say, yeah, it's Josh. And 50% um, of the time they actually talk about you and not Josh or Schmidt. So, so that's quite good. Yeah, that, that is really good to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so please have a seat as well. Okay, so both of our players are about to uh, start this game. We just need to perform the die roll to see who's going to go first between these two. So Lucas got uh, four, not too bad. And Joshua's got a one. So you can decide who goes first. I would like to start. All right. So Luca is allowed to go first. With that, the stage has been set. We need to hook up these players so we cannot talk about their decks just yet. But in just a minute, you're going to get all the information about their decks and actually all the other decks in the tournament from Daniel Neville and Marcello Barberi. Take it away, guys. Welcome to WCQ Utrecht, round one of the largest European championship ever. Yeah, it is going to be a huge one. Uh, we were here already two years ago. Yeah, I remember that very well. Uh, and uh, for some reason, I, I, I think I, you appeared on the feature sure. match a bit that year. Yeah, a um. few times. A few times. <laughs> I didn't need to. And as Oliver said, there are other people today trying to do what I did two years ago. Yes. Uh, in particular, we saw yesterday and you guys from home can go and watch again, both on YouTube and here on Twitch, uh, the future matches we had for the playoff. Exactly. In the end, uh, spoiler alert, uh, Joshua Smith, Jonas Koschel and Rafael Neven will be representing Europe at the World Championship in Germany. 
later this August. But we will also discover three more players going exactly. tomorrow. So we have a lot of action going on. As uh, Oliver said, we are still waiting on the actual number, but it is uh, probably going to be around 1,900 players, which is a ridiculous amount. And uh, unfortunately, for round one, you usually pick the last year champion, which yes, would have been Luke, Luke Parks. Parks. Uh, but we uh, we got told by his friends, uh, uh, um, with Joshua Eusters being one of them, yeah. uh, that he missed his flight. So sometimes it does happen. Uh, it is not a good feeling. Uh, but I mean, it's uh, a struggle of living on an island. You know, I guess, everybody I guess. else in Europe can just drive here. UK yeah. and Ireland. We always have I to fly. I mean, you don't want to drive here, but yeah, I guess you have the, the option. It's an if, option. Uh, it's flat. It's nice go, and easy drive. If things go bad. But anyway, uh, we have a good replacement. Uh, sorry, yeah. Joshua, to call you that. But <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, a very good player. Uh, we are still playing in his uh, home country, uh, which is the Netherlands, of course. Uh, he, he won twice uh, the national champion, and he is quite an accomplished player. He had some success. I would say probably this season was his best for his entire career. Yeah, he's done he, well this yeah, season. He topped events even abroad. Uh, we said yesterday how much uh, Rafael loves to travel around, and Josh Hosters is usually his uh, travel buddy, we can say. Yeah. Uh, anyway, for. Um, um, yeah. Just in addition to that, we've seen one Dutch player qualify already. Yes. Joshua is clearly trying to be another Dutch player representing the Netherlands at the World Absolutely. Championship. Absolutely. Even though we got to say that he took the completely different approach for his, from his friend, Rafael, because we saw yesterday uh, the majority of players at the play of use combo decks, and in particular, Thunder Dragon, Crusadia, yes. while for Joshua Oosters, he will be using uh, Sky Striker. Yeah. Which no is, surprise. I mean, it's what he played at Dutch Nationals. Exactly. This is a different build, um, but it is... You know, it, it is a deck that he's clearly comfortable on. He had been saying a lot leading into Dutch Nationals how he was going to win the event with Burning yeah. Abyss. It, uh, and I mean, he never followed <laughs> through on that. I mean, and also, it is uh, um, also kind of weird to say because Dutch Nationals was, uh, I believe, in the first weekend of yes, Nationals. we were first weekend. So it was the first time the new set was even legal, and he was one of the first players to use Mystic Mind Sky Striker. Yeah. And after so many weeks, uh, almost a couple of months, uh, he is back with Sky Striker, but this time no Mystic Mind to be seen. Not in the main deck, not in the side deck. Uh, kind of following what Marcus Patel did at UK Nationals yeah. winning it. Uh, he is instead choosing to play Summon Limit and some other touches. He said he's not that comfortable with this deck, yeah. but I think it makes sense in such a huge event. It, it's a solid deck. Uh, speaking of solid yes. decks, though, Luca is playing Salomon Great, which is also just super consistent in this format. It has a toolbox, it likes playing Absolutely. from the graveyard, it has a lot going on, and it's quite strong in this matchup, I think. I think so, and we have seen how Salomon Great was the most played decks for months now, yeah. and so that's why we would like to show you guys what the breakdown actually looks like for decks yeah. uh, when we are beginning this event. So our our. Um, our deck check team have done an excellent job. So we have the deck breakdown, which will be on screen in a second. Yes. Um, here we go. So there as, we can see. As so. we can see, this is not a fully complete breakdown, but it's going to give us a good idea of the field. We have Salmon Great as most represented, which is what we expect, followed by Orcus, which again is represented, but it's kind of falling off a little bit. People are realizing, hey, Lancia yeah. is a really strong card against my deck. Um, and we see the Thunder Dragons also that are definitely increasing in popularity. As you're saying, uh, we still have to wait for the final number, but this is probably what it will look like in the end. Uh, we saw yesterday the complete dominance from the deck. Honestly, there were five out of eight combo decks, uh, but still the top four was only Thunder Dragon or the Thunderless Joshua version, yes. we can say. Yeah. So this is looking like it will be quite uh, a good event with a lot of different decks, uh, a lot of good players, a lot of national champions, which, uh, again, they will have a VIP package. So we want to try and show you guys as many of those guys as possible. Alongside uh, the guys that most likely didn't make it yesterday, they're still competing, but we can't see them right now because they have an even better VIP package uh, because today two they have two rounds buys. Three. Best awesome. thing ever. Get a sleep in. Excellent. Like, rest is so important for this. Absolutely. But anyway, our players are ready and are getting drawn right now. So let's go to the table. OK, so Luca is after winning the dice roll. He's going to be going first. How are you feeling that game one is going to go in this matchup? 
Uh, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, actually looking at Joshua Deckless, first of all, I want to say that I don't think he wants to go second. He is not playing Mystic Mind, so I do think that it is a different matchup. But to be honest, for how Sky Striker is built, you do not mind going second anyway. Yeah. So the die roll in this matchup is uh, not as important, I want to say. Uh, but Luka deck is quite unique as well, so... Yeah, I, I mean, realistically, this is the sort of matchup where we're expecting it to go a long number of turns, really. Both of these decks are trying to get to the point where they're establishing a lot of advantage every turn. And whoever, like, if, if the Sky Striker player ends up resolving multiple engages in one turn, then they're in a strong position. And alternatively, if the Salmon Great player is able to start recycling their counter trap card, then they will take over the game. So both of these guys are aiming for a similar game plan, and so it's a really skillful matchup because it's a case of who can manage to get their resources online most effectively. Yeah, here we see uh, the new trend for the Salaman Grid deck. Uh, Bufferlo was a card that a lot of players were back and forth on, but I think it is uh, now pretty much confirmed to be one of the best uh, versions of the deck. I think it makes yeah. a lot of sense to be playing multiple copies of Bufferlo just because uh, it will allow you, especially after siding, to see your side deck cards a lot more often. And yeah, I think it yeah. makes sense. I mean, so we see Cyanet mining a tree as well, and that was a card that people were weirdly unsure on. And basically any card in this deck which makes it more likely for you to see Gazelle turn one is fantastic. And then if you already have the Gazelle, like you said, Bufferlo can draw you into yeah. your real trap cards, things like Artifact Sanctum, which we see in the main deck here. And Sanctum is such a powerful card in this format. It fell off a little bit when we had the start of the format with cards like Mystic Mine being super prevalent. But now that Mine has reduced its kind of appearance in the format, Sanctum is kind of coming back in and really doing a lot of work. Absolutely. I, I definitely agree with Luca's decision to main it. Uh, I would surely main it as well for this event and probably side deck copies of Trap Trick. Uh, we saw yesterday in the match between Paul and Joshua Jao, how good the card is uh, going against Thunder Dragon especially. Uh, he literally just won uh, because of it. He plays around Denkoseka very well. So, and Twister, uh, th there is really not much that can be done against the uh, Artifact Sight at the moment. Uh, the main answers being uh, Gamma or like Impermanence, uh, but Gamma is not even an option because usually they can summon it under a Sunlight Wolf. Yes. So, yeah. I think it makes sense. Uh, his version is quite unique though because he's only maining one copy of Trap Trick. Uh, but he will have additional targets in the side deck, so I think his version it is uh, quite a peculiar Tra one. Trap Trick is quite interesting in this list because he's playing two Sanctum and he's playing two Rage. And so it's kind of a case of he has said, hey, look, I'm not sure if I want to play Triple Sanctum or I want to play Triple Rage, so I'll compromise and I'll play this Trap Trick, which can, which can count as either of them. Um, which is yeah, I, I mean, I, I get it, and personally, I like everyone who, who just usually watches the this stream knows how much I am in love with Trap Trick. Like ever since it was released, I I felt in love with it, and I and I was sure that it was gonna be one of the most impactful cards, especially in the side deck, because it's just like any card that in Yu-Gi-Oh say you can choose such a wide number of cards from your deck has to be good. And with Sanctum being uh, such a strong option alongside uh, like Heavy Storm Duster or Full House, which we have seen from Jesse Cotton uh, last weekend, yeah, uh, it makes that card just so, so good. Anyway, now he's going for the full usual combo. Uh, he's playing the one copy of Will that we're seeing right now that kind of felt off in popularity. But in this case, he allowed him to still search for the trap, while Joshua and still looking quite uh, solid. As we were saying, even though he's playing a Sky Striker that wants to go first, just by how Sky Striker is uh, inherently built, you are okay with going second as well. Yeah, I, I mean, a hand of six spell cards is where you want to be in Striker. And having things like Reinforcement of the Army, we see that there's a Jamming Waves as well, which will be really nice to use here. So Joshua should be able to get three spells in Grave very quickly and then start getting those two for ones which Striker offers you. And Absolutely. That's, that's why in any of these kind of 
uh, more tempo-y matchups where people are just playing small monsters and trying to generate advantage, Striker is really strong. Uh, especially cards like Called by the Grave, he'll be able to not only remove threats and get spells, but he will also be able to weaken Luca's follow-up turns. Okay, so now uh, Joshua is definitely unhappy that he missed the roar. Uh, he got the impermanence uh, down, but I think the area zero is gonna be very important here. Uh, we saw yesterday with Sebastian Ma, unfortunately missing it, how impactful that was. But, um, I, I, I think going area into Ray here is quite nice because you can try baiting the counter trap with Ray's effect because you will be able to yeah. get... Okay. But it's really important here, so let's see if we can find any card. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. wow. That, wow. that is that what was you close. want to see there. That was very close. So uh, Multiroll is by far the best card you can get right there. Because now he has three spells in grave, the multi roll forces the roar. Uh, you can't really let it resolve because otherwise you can't negate anymore with it. So yep, this is going to exactly. be huge for Joshua. He will be able to resolve multiple engages uh, for plus one. Yeah. Which is just the best opening for the deck. I, I still think I liked the uh, ray line, but this is working out for him. Um, because if you followed the ray line, then you would be able to grab the multi-roll and destroy But how would field you get spell. to... Because you have an engage in hand. So you force the negation... But then if you miss effect. it, what do you do? Because he doesn't have anything else alive in his hand. That's the, what I'm thinking. Like if they engage True. and the area zero are the only... If he misses with the area zero then, uh, he is done. So he has to try and get something good with Varya. So now, as expected, the multi roll gets negated. Um, at least Luca has the Phantasmi in his hand, which is uh, the best hand chops by far against the uh, Sky Striker, I would say. Yeah. Um, but even in the case that he picks up an Ash Blossom with it, uh, Joshua still has the second copy of Call by the Grave in his hand. Yeah. Uh, which is something that uh, we have not seen that much in Sky Striker anymore. I'm not a fan of it personally. But I mean. The problem with Called by the Grave is that it has difficulty interacting with the yeah. combo decks in the format because if they go first, it just isn't doing anything against Thunder Dragons. So like we saw at NAWCQ that cards like Infinite Impermanence were performing very well, yeah. right? Uh, there were a lot of Striker decks at that event which were on Impermanence and Mystic Mind. Absolutely. And it's surprising to see that Joshua hasn't gone that direction. I mean, he is playing, uh, so he picked up on Jesse Cotton um, decklist because he is playing the Utopia double package, yeah. which is actually something that we could see happen right away here. Because by having Cold by the Grave for a possible effect Veiler or Ash Blossom, he can go for the OTK. So let's see what he does here. I think he is going for it. Yes, so Shark Cannon gets back to Jaguar, and now we are going to see the Ray being summoned and nice. the Utopia double OTK probably coming down. Yeah. So. It shook uh, the world uh, by surprise, winning Jesse Cotton his match uh, for the World Championship and uh, last weekend. And now uh, it seems like Joshua is going to win the same way. I mean, when in doubt, you yes. be out, right? <laughs> so <laughs> Joshua wins game one with Utopia Double. You can see him uh, smiling about it. And we're going to see a game two uh, very soon. So. <laughs> Quite that, the impactful that, that strategy. Look into the camera from Joshua. Yes. Right? <laughs> uh, Utopia Double is such a crazy card because we spent the longest time where Sky Striker just didn't have a win condition and you were just there sitting for turns being like, I ought to attack directly. Yeah. <laughs> I ought to attack directly. And now you just go, 10k damage? Do you have a response? Yeah, it is uh, still like uh, a little bit of risk because if you do draw the Utopia Double, like Double or Nothing, uh, it doesn't do anything basically. Uh, yeah. So you have to push uh, less less damage there, but I think it does make sense for such a control deck. If you build it to be combo decks, then you have a win condition against the mirror match, for example. Yeah, and it is working out. So um, for the side decks now, Luca gotta be scared because uh, he just goes first. His opening wasn't even that bad, but he got OTK'd by Sky Striker, which is something that. 
<laughs> it shouldn't be happening. Yeah, more than a week ago, I think everyone would have probably thought that I was going crazy. Yeah. But now it is an option. So I believe he will be signing out the artifact package because even though it is good against Utopia, it's not really good against Sky Striker. Yeah. And he does have a lot of side deck cards option because he is still playing Shared Ride, which is a card that we were used to see in the mirror matches from Sky Striker, mm -hmm. but really fell in popularity. And Paolo, uh, the three times back-to-back -back winner, was the one who used it um, a couple of weeks ago at the South American Vuci Coup. And uh, it seems like Luca picked up on his idea. Yeah. Uh, for Joshua, what do you think he's going to bring in? Uh, so he has quite a lot of options, but I mean, he has Sphere Mode, which is not really relevant in this matchup. Yeah. Uh, you need the normal summon against Salomon Great, and like it's not impactful enough. Uh, effect Failure is an option, but I don't think you have any real need for it. You kind of want to have spell cards or things that increase your yeah. redundancy here. So there's an option to bring an Artifact Sanctum, but when you're going second, not really interested in that. So I guess Twin Twisters? But like again, it, uh, Twisters matches poorly into Salomon Great. I mean, you probably just cited in case your opponent is playing anti-spell fragrance. Yes. We saw a few... few I mean, uh, not, We see not a lot of people yeah. with order. Like, there's yeah, a lot of lists everywhere. which are just playing one order, and you don't want to just lose a game to a 1 in 40 card. Yeah, but at the same time, it's also possible that Joshua expect him to let him start, because usually Sky Striker at the moment want to go second, and from what we saw, uh, it could have looked like it was Jesse that plays card by card, so... Yeah, for sure. There is no way that Luca uh, knows that Joshua is not playing Mystic Mind. He does draw into Shared Ride, though, so that's going to be a huge, uh, huge pickup here. He's maining Shared Ride. Side or, sorry, yeah. sorry, Luca is siding Shared Ride. Yeah, Shared Ride is really insane against Sky Striker. Like, for anybody who was playing in formats where Max C existed, Shared Ride has a similar effect on Sky Striker. Uh, as it is, Joshua's hand isn't very prone to it, though. But he also needs to find... Oh, no, he has multi in Area Zero, so he has yeah. access to Ray Guaranteed. And no, his hand is looking very good. He could be just going for another Utopia double TK, yeah. possibly. So. Uh, the cool thing with Area Zero is you never have to choose to add the card. So even if he reveals the Sky Striker card after Shared Ride has been activated, he can choose not to take it. So now we're just going to see the... Usual thing, since uh, Luca only really engine card was the sign and mining, he's not gonna have access to the trap cards, but he's still gonna end on the gazelle in hand for next turn. So, yeah, a decent opening and uh, just having shared ride, you gotta feel quite comfortable here. Shared ride is really good here. <laughs> And he has infinite impermanence, which also gives him some protection from Utopia Double, which is yeah. also nice for him. And Ash Blossom also prevents the search of Double. Yeah, it will be very difficult for Joshua to pull out the OTK in this spot. And as I was saying, there is also a word in which he just sided it out, considering the um, Salomon Great might let you start uh, post side, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I love the uh, contrasting sleeves you guys have here. They're, they're in the wrong zones, but... <laughs> yes, it would have been cool to have them. Uh... We'll need to talk to the production yes. team and be like, guys... Blue Check the sleeves before designing was red and blue. Yeah, exactly. Very important. So... Terraforming is picked up. Uh, it doesn't line up well against uh, the shared ride, but... No, I think he set terraforming and hit it with your area zero here. That's generally what I'd Yeah, if you like. don't play Mystic Mind it's, uh, as Joshua, you pretty much have to do that. Yeah. Even Let's if you play see. Mine, like Mystic Mind isn't doing anything here. You would yeah. rather get a real card instead of the terraforming. Cold by the Grave Door is picked up, which will be able to negate the Ash Blossom at least. Yeah. Uh, but the. I think the multi roll is one of the most important cards here. Um, Multi-roll is the best card in the deck at the moment. Yeah, by far. I mean, Engage is pretty decent as well. But. Okay, sure. Engage is the best card because it finds multi-roll. 
But yeah, now we're gonna see a shared drive being chained. And as you said, there is an option that Joshua doesn't pick up the card because uh, it is optional. Yeah, realistically, if he sees a rare engage, he's taking it. But otherwise, he doesn't have to Let's be committed. See. I think he takes it right here. He does have the option. I mean, he could uh, not take the rare and just use the area zero. Yeah, that Instead, is an option. Uh, so if he wants to take the ray, I don't think you do. I think you just add here. I mean, he could try to go for game at the same time, which is I don't is think fair. he needs to, though, because... Oh, he's taking Widow Anchor. Okay. So the only problem with going for the Utopia OTK in this case would have been... Uh, the Impermanence. The Upster Goblin. <laughs> oh, sure. Because yeah. uh, then you can barely miss it. Because... Uh, what you usually deal, uh, it's uh, 8200. Yeah. So, uh, but if you have uh, an anchor afterwards, it is possible. So, yeah. We'll uh, see. Uh, we're probably gonna see a Nash Blossom coming down here if uh, Luca feels like it, because at least uh, you're gonna force Joshua to go for some draws. But in that case, there is still Cold Body Grave. So this game, even though Shared Ride is gonna um, uh, pretty much slow down Joshua, uh, is still quite an open game because you get to three spells in Grave uh, easily. Yeah. And it means we're not likely to see Kagari this turn, and most likely the Ash will be held for Shizuku's effect in the end phase at this point. Uh, I don't even think you do though, because you want to get the card from Shared Ride. Sure. So I think you just hold it at this point. So that's why I was thinking this is the best Ash target, because... I, I think in general, just stopping access to Ray is really important. Yeah. But maybe he's afraid that since Joshua didn't pick up uh, a Ray, there was uh, another in his hand for the OTK with yeah. the Utopia double, so... Very pretty ultimate rare. I oh, yeah. coming down. I love that the uh, three most popular of the Striker Links have been printed in Ultimate. We just need Kaina at this point, and then you can have a full... Which, to be honest, is one of the most impactful ones when you're in timeout, though. So like, <laughs> it, it literally changes <laughs> the win condition of the deck, so... Yes, I mean, kind of no for game for is Kaina. most... It is probably the most hated one as I, well. I, I'm sure everybody in the chat will tell us how much they love Kaina, yeah. Really nice artwork, uh, but definitely an odd effect. Sending Shark Cannon so he'll be able to set it off multi-roll. Yeah, now he will be able to push some more damage here. And unfortunately, he's already used a multi-roll effect, so he won't be able to send the wolf to the graveyard using it. Yeah. He has a few options here. I'm pretty sure he, will, he does play Ningirsu, for example. Um, yeah, I, I like Ngirsuing the back row here. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Because having access to, like, anchors and shark cannons, plus just a monster that is bigger than 1800, yeah. is really relevant in this matchup. Even though here, uh, any back row 8 would really hurt. Like, if that was, like, an heavy storm duster, cyclone twister, whatever, oh, uh, sure. losing the multi roll would be a huge deal here. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely agree that you should uh, use it. What card are you going to send? Eagle Booster, Called By, or Widow Anchor? I mean, you can send itself, honestly. I, I don't yeah. mind it. Like, but you, um, I mean, you don't have any direct access to Ray, right? Yeah, that's the main problem. And that's the issue with both Area Zero and Hercules Base, is when they are set again off. Okay, but now change, things changes completely because... Oh, that's uh, convenient. Yes, that's very... <laughs> now there is not even a question about what to send because Luca decides to use his Gazelle. Since he saw one Widow Anchor being used by Joshua, unfortunately Joshua was holding a second copy. Yep. And now, I mean, Nick Kirsu is pretty much going to send the Gazelle. Yeah, uh, that's, that's backbreaking. Why didn't he negate it, though? I mean, do you think he's going to go for Bomber afterwards? I guess it's fine, yeah. Uh, like, does he play Bomber? He probably does, but... I don't think he has space because... No, he would ah, have had to have gone of, into Phoenix. I mean, okay. So he doesn't have space because he's playing the Utopia package, and for his uh, Link 4, he has decided to play Boral yeah. Sword. That's which why is I was kind of weird. Yeah. Like, Boral Sword and Utopia do very much the same thing. 
That's why I think you sh I mean, I'm pretty sure Jesse Cotton still played the Bomber, I think. Yeah, I, I really like Bomber. Bomber yeah. is like one of the most underrated Link monsters that we have seen printed. Absolutely. With the exception of Firewall and Saryuza and Boral Sword and Boral Oge, it's the best Link for. Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm really curious to why you didn't chain the Impermanence. I mean, it would have been rewarded because Joshua is not playing the Bomber. Yeah. And I mean, worst case scenario, you can use the Bale Links to kind of protect you from the Bomber, but... Uh, now it is quite tough to out this kind of field. I mean, what can you get here with its field? You have a sanctuary. I mean, the buffer low pickup is kind of nice. Is nice. Even though you can just steal it with the, one of the anchors, but it kind of forces you to do that. Um, like, what Salomon Great can you get here, which lets you continue playing? It is pretty much impossible since you have the buffer low. Because yeah. if you had something else, then Foul was an option, but you yeah. know that Joshua is in a very comfortable spot. Joshua's in a really strong spot. The best play here might just be set Buffalo in defense position pass. Because it's hard for Striker to deal with that. Yeah. Like, they have difficulty interacting with set monsters. Here it's where you see the evenly siding and going first <laughs> that we have seen, like, against uh, with Bing, I think, right? Was it Pink that sided in, or Typhoon? And back in YCS London, I remember there was someone siding in evenly going first and just blowing out oh, sure. everything. Um, I think it might have been Typhoon. Yeah. Um. So now, okay, Joshua decides that the buffer low is fine. So these two draws are the most important from Luca, but Cold Body Grave is flipped and all hope seems to be lost. Surprised he let him go into the bailings. I mean, it does but make I sense if you have Cold Body Grave. Like, you don't really care at that point. If, yep. he, if he didn't have it, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't even let him do. Uh, so now there is not much that Luca can do. Unfortunately, it seems like Joshua is locking out this. I think he just passed. And Was saying I'm just banishing, yeah. not summoning. Uh, Jaguar is getting banished, uh, and yeah, and this was what we were saying, where it's a case that one of the decks gets to the point where it has so many cards, and Joshua has gotten to that point because he has multi-role and he's able to start getting cards with impact. Mm -hmm. He's able to just lock Luca out of the game. Phoenix is coming down, and Phoenix is really Yeah, nice. at least you have a chance here, but... Yes, I was about to say, there is no way Joshua doesn't use the Widow Anchor here. Yeah. He's gonna take it, and... Uh... Yeah, he can send Sanctuary to yeah. summon Foxy, but Foxy... Foxy will clear the multi-roll. At least, which is a pretty big deal, honestly, because yeah. Joshua, I don't think he's holding any cards at the moment, which is... Uh... Definitely relevant. That are all the cards he has. The Phoenix gets back. Let's see if he picks up anything relevant. His last card on the field is Eagle Booster. And I think he picked up another Widow Anchor. I mean, that is the type of card that you want to draw. In yes, he did pick up uh, a Widow Anchor, and now uh, he is going to rely on the Area Zero, but work his and out of the Widow Anchor is a very good pickup here. Yeah, it's important. It lets you grab the Phoenix. Yeah, and then you are able to try and... Uh, so Luca gets destroy. to choose the zone that the card returns to, so he would have been able to put the Phoenix pointing to the Ningirsu, so having the Widow Anchor was quite relevant Indeed. in that scenario. But he didn't, he let Joshua pick yeah. for him, and now he's gonna be able to push it. He's gonna be kind of a top deck work as Luca. Uh, do you ash the Area Zero if you're him? I think you do, uh, like I there is so. nothing else on the field, so he is not, yeah he is, I mean I'm pretty sure he will do it. There is nothing else on Joshua and so this could still go either way, but he doesn't and engage is picked up. Wow. I mean, he's I mean, still... He has for the yeah, engage. he's still able to negate it, but at the same time, the Phoenix uh, might have got back to him. I think he's yes. still playing around the Bomber, so... 
He doesn't want Joshua to still keep the Phoenix around for a possible play. And now the engage will be negated. And if Luca picks up uh, like a gazelle, he's still back into competition. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, Luca is very much in top deck mode. Yeah. But he does have some good top decks. He, he does, he does. He Even though uh, and gazelles. he will not be able to clear this Ningirsu. Okay, Joshua L. Dengage. Playing Having a read, uh, I mean, he did have a read because honestly, Luca was thinking about the area zero. So, I mean, Ooh. unless an ogre is there, that's a top deck. Yes, Gazelle comes down. Okay, we have a game. We have a game. Uh, so. Unfortunately, there is an eagle booster set. So yeah. an Ingersu is just going to be it's gonna an unmovable object this turn, um, which means Luca can't apply any pressure. Absolutely, and uh, and if the engage is able to start generating value, especially with the area zero, then Joshua could potentially take this on the following turn. Yeah, and the Jack Jaguar being banished by the uh, Shark Hunter earlier on. Yes, also means that Luca doesn't have access to it because he's only playing the one copy. So, yeah, it's a it's a big struggle in deck building because. You know, it's a case of you want to play two Jack Jaguars in case one gets banished, but it's also a really bad card to draw. Yeah. I mean, I think it makes sense to just play the one because the trend we are seeing in Salomon Great decks uh, that Luca also followed was to cut Cold by the Grave. Yeah. I think it does make sense because the only deck meaning a lot of Antrops at the moment is the Mirror Match. And the uh, Antrops are not as good if you are the one playing Salomon Great. So. If you're yeah. not facing uh, that many call by the grave, then call like one Jaguar is fine. Yeah, and like you said earlier, call by the grave isn't that common at the moment, which is really weird because it's such a strong card, but it also is so bad against combo. Yes, I really don't like it at the moment. It, it is in a weird spot where it really depends on what you're playing. If you're playing Orcus, you're of course forced to play it just because of how impactful Lancia is after siding. Yeah. But let's see, this draw from Joshua is going to be relevant. He still has access to Area Zero, so it all depends if he can get some relevant cards, because... Yeah. He's... I want to say he's still in the lead, uh, but not from... It, it could go either way at yeah, this point. Yeah, I mean, not as bad as he was, like, uh, last turn, I would say. Yeah. Like, losing the multi-roll is so big, and that's why Striker... <laughs> kind of struggles against Salomon Great, because if they just go Foxy, clear multi-roll, you're in a really tough position. Yeah, so let's see what the cards is. Joshua gets Ashed, um, which I'm surprised about because he played around Ash last turn. So the card he has picked up must be something relevant here, because otherwise I'm pretty sure if it wasn't, he would have always tried to set it and pop it with uh, the area zero first. So I'm very curious to see what he uh, what he picked up. Okay, so wow. So I'm I'm curious. I'm really not sure to why he didn't go for this first. Because if he picked up uh, a multi roll, that yeah. would have been like so much better. Afterburners is really nice though because he'll be able to destroy the Sunlight Wolf and then also destroy the Area Zero. But uh, the Area Zero was set by multi Oh, uh, right. So yeah. it is not really good at the moment. Uh, that That's why otherwise you would have probably used the Ningirsu on it. Uh, now, um, it is still quite back and forth. I think it all depends on like Joshua uh, card drawn from turn. But yeah. Just by how we played around Ash last turn. I want to believe it is a good card. Like, there is no way it is not. It could be a Ray by how he's playing this. I or mean, like if he drones. has a Ray or any way to Ray, he's in a really good position. Yeah. And regardless, uh, you can check the timer. There are only 12 minutes uh, left, and Joshua is leading 1 0. Yeah. So, regardless, we know that once you get close to timeout, Striker is in a really good spot. It doesn't seem like it is a good card, so... I am very surprised to why he didn't just go for Aria Zero first, but... 
now Luca is completely back into the game. Uh, he still has the Sunlight Wolf. Uh, he picked up another Gazelle with the Circle, so... Yeah, and he'll be able to go into Heath Leo and start clearing Joshua's guards. Like, being able to get rid of the Area Zero uh, yeah. would be really nice. Because now he can also send uh, the Roar, which he yeah. was basically denied uh, for this entire match. Um, if he can start getting his trap card set up, then it doesn't matter what Joshua is drawing. Okay, so the shark cannon was what Joshua had. Targeting Ash. What? I'm confused. <laughs> um, I mean, no, I'm not confused because like he wants to deny Silent Wolf from getting it back. Yeah. Which is fair. But at the same time, uh, like... I mean, it's 1800 defense. Also, if you have access to Stalio, you can just get it back that way. So I think if you're Lucas, you should try and go for that play. Because yeah. then if you go for Stalio, you bounce back the Ash, it gets back to your end. It is such a good play there. And you know that the last card in Joshua End is Afterburner, which is useless. I think Luca really, really needs to uh, speed things up. Yes, he needs to end this game so that he can make sure he has time okay. in game three. Will is back, so he might just go for the bounce back play. So, oh, I yeah. mean, yeah, go ahead. Realistically, here, Joshua's not under any pressure to end this game right now. Oh, you know, he's not. As I was saying, he's completely fine. Like, I think he even knows that he doesn't have that many chances in this game, but. I mean, he's still sitting on 8,000 life points, so there is really no reason to scoop up. Uh, uh, I mean, unless there are like three, less than three minutes on the clock, because yeah. there is a large... Uh, oh, did he just pass? It's very odd. What? Uh, it looks like Joshua might have just drawn a multi-roll, which is really big, because... But not as big again, because uh, he can't... Uh... Well, he has area zero, so he can clear his ash. Yeah, yeah, no, it is good to Oh, do. He, he can't get Ray yeah. off it, but at the same time, he can I'm start bringing back I'm very confused to what happened, though, place. like... What just happened here? I mean... Because, like, I think he had access to a lot of things. Like, he could have sent Roar, he could have sent Rage, he could have sent, like, another Spin Eagle for Stalio, then get back the Ash. Is it possible that Luca just forgot about the Area Zero and was like, okay, I'm going to leave Dash there so that your plays are locked? I think that makes the most sense because I don't really see a word in which you just do this Falco play. I'm very confused here. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure he would have been able to do a lot. And now Joshua has a chance because with double multi roll being picked up, he can set uh, the Anchor, the Shark Cannon and try to fight back in this game. Yeah. So the destruction is prevented, but Afterburners is still tracked as being activated, which means Joshua is going to be able to set three cards, including Sky Striker Mobilize and Gate. Yeah. And he can even set two cards with the same name because he's going to be using each of the multi rolls. Yeah, different multi rolls. Because uh, let's uh, remember, we are going to bring it up for you guys on the screen. Neither of uh, the second effects from multi roll are once per turn. Yeah. So if you activate more than one, you can still resolve both, as you can see here from Joshua. And this is surprisingly looking tough once more for Luca. I really don't understand what he was trying to accomplish last turn. I mean, it, it, sometimes you just overthink yourself into the wrong play. Yeah. And that's potentially what happened there. Again, it's a lot of pressure playing first round on feature match against the national champion. Absolutely. But with multi-role being resolved, again, Joshua now has a lot of material to start working with. Luca does have the fact that he'll be able to bring back a card like Foxy uh, and clear one of the multi-role, but Joshua has two. So he'll need to Foxy to clear one and then Heat Leo to try and clear the other. Yeah. But that's burning a lot of resources. Again, I am very confused by this. Like, I don't think the game is necessarily over regardless, but like last turn there were so many lines that Luca could have gone for. 
He could have went Stalio, bounce back the Ash. He could have just pushed some damage and then uh, rely on a Roar, on a Rage, which are really good when the game state is so simple, like as yeah. simple as now. I mean, and now he's just going to try and force some back rows with the Eat Leo. But since the Sanctuary was used earlier on, he's not going to be able to reincarnate them. So, yeah. I think realistically, we're likely to see a Widow Anchor coming down here. Just negate the Heat Leo. Because realistically, you want to be defending the multi roll here. I'm surprised that the Heat Leo didn't target the multi roll. Yeah. Did he not use it? Well, if he's targeting the Anchor, you might as well just I mean, keep he... Anchor available because if Luca has more extenders, then by saving the anchor, if you need to wall, you can just steal the heat leo. Whereas if you negated it, you, you don't sure. get your spell card. Uh, it depends on how though. many cards you have in your graveyard, I guess. Because like in general, if you die, if you have more targets, you just want to have more counters on the mold throw. Anyway, yeah. now we get confirmation that Luca did have additional targets. So uh, his play last turn made even uh, less sense, in my opinion. Um, but now, again, time is going to be very relevant because I only see one option for this game, which is either Joshua is going to win the match yes. or we're probably going to see a draw. Yeah, I exactly. don't see a world in which Luca is going to take it, especially because he's not even citing like Paro or uh, any like crazy emergency provisions madness that yeah. we we have seen honestly I mean, in the last Paro, weeks. Paro was quite successful at I think German Nationals. There were quite a few yeah. people playing it. And uh, Italians love emergency provision. <laughs> but we also saw it last weekend at the USA, USA Nationals. I so. mean, emergency provisions is banned at Worlds, right? So, it is. It is. Everything you know. is banned. Uh, <laughs> like those, uh, yeah. Did you ever, in your deck building for Worlds, go, oh, I'd love to play Emergency Provisions, <laughs> no. and I'd be I like, mean, oh, I mean, I would have liked to, because honestly, like, when I lost in top four, I lost both of my games in time. Like, I won game one, and then I lost both in time. So I guess if they were banned, maybe yeah. I should have played the Emergency Provisions. You know how True Draco Apocalypse works now, though. I do. Yes. I do. Important. It's such a weird niche interaction. Speaking of weird niche interactions, Multi-roll is a really interesting card because the way it tracks spell card activations, it does not have to be active per se. So if Imperial Order is on the field negating multi-roll, it will still track the cards activated. And if Imperial Order is removed from the field later in the turn, multi-roll will still remember even if it was, if it was negated. Yeah, because it is quite time. different from like the spell counters. Yes. Where, like, for example, if you skill drain and there are spell counters, then all of the spell counters are removed, which is also something that is not very known. Yeah, so spell counters are... To, to be able to hold spell counters on a card, a card has an effect that yes. says it can do so. And so anything that affects the direct properties of the card... Yeah, which I think is, is not the, obvious, the most obvious thing, because no. you have cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! that... Uh, actually can put spell counters on different cards in your field. So just, well, it is how it works and uh, it is relevant because uh, we have saw in the breakdown the Pendulum is still played at this event and it is one of yes. the scariest deck, I would say. So Yeah, we saw uh, like at UK Nationals, we saw the 60 card Pendulum decks which were playing Magical Citadel, Vendemian and yeah. all of the spell counters stuff. This game has been incredibly back and forth, but I think Joshua is going to be able to grab Engage here, and that will put him in a strong spot. Although, uh, yeah. Luca has the double Ash Blossom, it doesn't matter because multi roll will Absolutely. guarantee the Engage. Uh, Joshua can probably find sufficient damage here if he has. Yeah, Widow I think Anchor he has remaining. more than enough time. Uh, the only thing he has to play around is the Phantasme in hand from Luca, yeah. uh, which you can actually do play around. Uh, when you resolve the multi roll. So, yeah. It is uh, quite a unique interaction that is also kind of obscure by a lot of players. Since multi roll says that you can't chain anything to spells, you can also play around Roll and Lock Bird, for example, or those kind of cards just yes. by, like, for example, here, you resolve Engage. And then, since you're a turn player, you have priority to use, for example, an Order Drones. And uh, your opponent will not be able to draw and lock you, which is a huge thing. Yeah, it was really big back at YCS London, particularly. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, where Droll and Lock was just so popular because of the danger uh, FTK. Yes. But I think after the playoffs yesterday, I would be very surprised if people didn't pick up on Droll for this event. It is probably the best stand up against the Crusader Danger deck. Yeah, I, I think Droll and Lancia are the standout hand traps of this format. Again, they're just super impactful. They are reminiscent of Maxi in terms of they just stop so much from happening. And that's really what you want your hand traps to be doing. We see Ash Blossom being played in every deck, but it's super low impact. Absolutely. So now... Oh, are we going for oh, Utopia? Oh, we might see another <laughs> Utopia double, which actually wouldn't be that good, though, because it would make the Ash Blossom in Luka and live, which I would be surprised about. Yeah. It's kind of weird, uh, because if... Based on the amount of time here... Didn't Joshua actually know about the Ash? Uh, I think he might. So I feel it okay. was added back from the... <clears throat> wolf. Anyway, now we are seeing the Utopia double once more. Um, and we do see the Ash Blossom. Yes, he picks up his cards. Wow. I'm, I'm very surprised by this because he didn't know about it. So if he just went for a Yate there, the game yep. was over. 100%. Uh, even wow. even just going into normal Utopia and attacking over to Mars Stallion. Yes, he, he had a lot of lines. Like uh, as you say, even just going uh, regular Utopia was game. Ayate was game. Uh, I mean, Ayate maybe was uh, slightly more risky because of Phantasmi throwing him into effect Vader maybe. Sure. But just going Utopia and attacking was enough for Joshua. And I feel like he got ahead of himself. But maybe there is some extra time because I'm seeing the timer being reset. To three minutes. Okay, so they have additional time. So that, that I makes am, a bit more yes. sense then, because with the time that we saw on the clock, it just made sense to go into Hayate, uh, because you would be able to normal summon Ray and then use Ray effect in battle phase, so effect failure wouldn't ever yeah. be a concern. Uh, with three minutes remaining on the clock, Joshua is able to side and he is able to just aim to go go first, kind of. Gain yes, life I'm surprised to where it happened because it doesn't seem like they were playing particularly slow. So yeah. uh, I guess, I mean, we did miss the uh, extra time being issued. Yeah, so there was a slow play warning earlier in the match, which is where we're getting our extra three minutes from. Slow play always gives a minimum extension of three minutes. And now it does change a lot because uh, Joshua is able to go for the only non ultimate Sky Striker, which we talked about, which is Kena. And uh, I don't think Luga is playing many cars that are able to deal with it. The only ones being Impermanence. And yes, two copies of Effect Vader, but. Well, well Kena may not be an ultimate. It is the ultimate Sky Striker in time. It is, it is <laughs> for sure. And as predicted, this match is probably going to end uh, up winning for either Joshua or in a draw. Um, yeah. With Joshua probably risking the draw more than he should have uh, from how things were going in game two. Yeah. Uh, let's see, these, uh, these draws are going to be very important for both of them. Yeah. It is also possible that Joshua just breaks and he is forced to pass it in one happen. minute. He so. has a monster in hand, yeah. so hopefully for him that is a Ray. It could, however, be an Ash Blossom, which would be very unfortunate. But it looked like Ray. It is also possible that he doesn't have any usable spells along with yeah. it. Oh, he has multi-roll. Okay. And multi-roll is really great with Kaina, because if he activates any other spell card, he'll be able to go end phase Ray into Kaina, and then he can multi-roll effect in the end phase. Um, and just that activation will give him the 100, so he can dodge... Um, Ash Blossom, or he can dodge Valor. So now uh, Luca doesn't have much. He, the only card he has is an Ash Blossom, which is relevant if uh, not against Multirol, of course. But yeah. it would have been if the only access to Ray was the Area Zero. So he's still hoping that that's the only way this game goes. But ah, he oh, has side. oh, Joshua doesn't have it. Uh, so actually, Luca has a chance. He can just normal summon anything and attack for game. Yes, the time, my god, this game is turning so much against Joshua. Crazy. We thought the game was locked, but game two, a little bit of a slip up, and now he might just lose the entire match. What a turn of events. But he only has 30 seconds left. Like, 
you, you need to just go normal summon attack. Absolutely, like, like he doesn't uh, want to risk this. Of course, we're not sure if the timer is completely exact, but it should be pretty much. I mean, you're spinning wheels here, but you're not ending the game. And like, yes, there are only a couple seconds left. All he needs to do is try and attack here. Attack is declared. Is there anything or another gazelle? What is going on? Time is cold. Did he really not enter battle phase yet? I mean, he just summoned a gazelle, right? No way, no way this is what happened. <laughs> I, I don't believe this. I don't want to believe this. There is no way. No losers in round one? Wow. That is. This would be shocking if he did that. Players. Like, the only. Th oh my, an handshake. And I think this actually ends up in a draw. That's crazy. I mean, wow. So if you're Joshua, you have to be super happy about this. It is a draw, so let's just go back to us for a quick uh, post-match discussion. Wow, so it was quite a good way to start things off. Uh, uh, we had a really good match, uh, both players, uh, even though Joshua seemed to have the upper hand, both in terms of matchup and uh, fame, I would say. Sure. Uh, in the end, uh, I mean, Luca was still fighting back. Uh, we had the game one pretty much polarized by um, Joshua. He went second, but he was still able to combat whatever Luca was trying to do. Yeah. And uh, in the end, uh, he just got there with so much advantage with Engage and the uh, Utopia combo, which yes. now you should uh, know by now. Everyone watching and everyone playing at this event should know about Utopia Double. Uh, yeah, Utopia Double has gone from this like funny little cute deck to just being such a core part of Striker's identity in the format. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, you see how though the card now is being known, people are not wasting their end traps uh, trying to negate random stuff, and that's yeah. what happened in game two. Luca lost game one to Utopia. Game yeah. two, he was more cautious with the end trap. He waited for it, and Joshua risked it all for going into Utopia double. It didn't resolve. The game was over. So Joshua very surprisingly lost game two. I think they both had some very uh, weird plays in game two going on. They both could have taken it. Obviously, but then the unexpected things happen. Joshua gets to go first in game three. We only about a minute left in the round, yeah. and he bricks. Nothing at all. He has multi roll, artifact side, and a couple of spells. Double widow anchor and a shark cannon, which don't do anything when you're going first. Like he it's, couldn't, he couldn't even get three spells in grave. Absolutely unbelievable. And in the end, uh, Luca gets to draw his cards. He has a few Salomon Great cards, but nothing really. Uh, going on, we're not even sure what happened there because he, he, all he needed to do was summon Gazelle, attack, and win the game. He tried to go for a few plays, but in the end, that was not enough. Uh, anyway, we had a really good match. We're gonna have, if this is only the first match, I don't know exactly. what can wait for us. <laughs> so, guys, let's remember we have eight rounds for today, so a lot more action, but before that, we're gonna go back to Oliver. Yeah, we're back on the main event stage, this time with two players rather than one, because, as these guys just said, the match ended in a draw. And it was such a roller coaster ride, it went up and down, I saw it on your faces, in fact. And the big question is obviously, what happened at the end? Luca, you just, they just, just summon attack and you win. Yeah, I thought about way too much and just choked. Is it basically that playing in the, in the feature match with the lights on you and then there's a lot of people in front of you. I, I would say like 200 people watching this. Uh, was that too much pressure? Yeah, I mean, it was quite much pressure. And when you just pass the turn, I thought you just use Kainer and gain life points and win. When we just passed, I was so excited. I saw everyone and yeah. I mean, so. OK, so, so how are you feeling after this? I mean, it's not a loss, but you could have won. How are you feeling now about this? I mean, obviously, I'm kind of sad, but still drawing against him is still. He's a, he's a very good player. He's a very good player. So what was it like for you? I mean, there was se several instances where it looked like you had this match and yeah. then suddenly cards from the top, which is... Yeah, like there were two points in game two where I just had game 100%. At one point I had Ding Girsu, I should have just uh, Shark and his guy. Then Ding Girsu, my food spell away for his monster, then link to a Hita and then summon his guy and attack for game. I messed that up. And then in the basically the last turn before I went to the Utopia, I should have... 
instead of just let it go, I should have activated the anchor for like no reason. That I could have set the, um, what's it called? The eagle booster. Mm -hmm. And then I could have done the Utopia play anyway. And then when he did Ash, I could have just eagle boosted Utopia double. Right. And then I still attack for 10,000 and then I still win. But I didn't do that either. So, so good job. How are you job. feeling right now? I mean, I guess you should be happy about the draw, but... I guess, like, if you look at it from that perspective, I should be happy about the draw. But there, there were two instances in the game where I should have just won the match to O and I didn't. So that's a bit um, inconvenient for me, let's put it like that. But it's fine, it's European Championship, top 64, a draw is better than at a YCS. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. so um, you, got the, you basically got the worst thing behind you, like this is one of the hardest <laughs> challenges playing in the feature match. Do you feel from here on uh, for going forward it's going to be easier? I mean, it's not going to be easier, but it's a bit more... It's a very long tournament. Yeah. But still, I think it's very long day, I guess. Very long day tomorrow as well. So, um, what are you going into the second round feeling good about this? Mm, yeah. yeah, I think so, yeah. I think you can live with the result. It's, like you said, it's a good player. And what about you? I mean, you have been playing at a million large events, so, so you also know how to handle defeat or a draw. Um, what is the takeaway for you? Like, how are you going into the next round? It's just trying to relax in between rounds? Yeah, I think I'm just gonna like see how my friends did, um, get calm. Like, I don't feel that bad about it. Like, I know I, the plays I could have done, so right. probably next round I can just actually play them and then it's fine. So it's basically you, you don't beat up yourself about it. You're just like, okay, I may need to make a mental note. Next time I need to play this differently. And then you just do it for the rest of the day. Yeah, exactly. Like it's the first round, still tired. Now I'm a bit more awake. Okay. So I'll just pretend that's it and it's more fine. Okay, that's, that's, yeah. that's actually true for all of us. All right, guys. So, well, best of luck to both of you for the rest of the tournament. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, we, we might see these guys again in day two or even in the top card, who knows. With that, we're signing off for round number one. We're currently in overtime for the rest of the tournament. We try to keep the breaks in between rounds short. Probably not as short as yesterday when we had just like matches back to back. But that gives us uh, the option to record some interviews with national champions. Those will be streaming now and in between all the rounds. So enjoy the pre-recorded contents. We're going to be back very soon with the feature match of round number two.